Hi, I'm Stardad, and this is What's Up for the month of November 2020. October was a busy month. Lots of outreach and Mars parties, but this is November, and with it comes the return to normal, sane time, also known as Eastern Standard Time. Yay! The sun will set at a reasonable hour since we push the clocks back, and we can all stargaze earlier in the evening. With November comes the cool, crisp autumn nights, and with any sort of luck, the atmosphere begins to calm down as we approach our closest approach to the sun, but fewer photons hit our hemisphere because of the tilt of the Earth, which causes winter. So let's begin with the planets. Mercury is found in the morning sky just after sunrise. To find it, locate Venus, which is a very bright, quote, star, unquote, and then imagine it a line going to the east where you expect the sun to rise. There will be two objects there, Mercury and the star Spica, and they'll be less than five degrees apart. Of course, you'll need a good low horizon to the east to catch both Mercury and Venus. Venus, the cloudy and hottest planet, remains a late morning view, a little after 4 a.m., rising just before the sun. It's lit from 82 to 89 percent as the month progresses. The full moon will occur on Halloween, so maybe in this pandemic era, you can go out and howl at the moon in celebration of the night before All Souls Day. Mars is now starting to fall behind us, and soon we'll be saying goodbye to it. But it is still a respectable size, and if you have a long focal length telescope, say 2,000 millimeters or longer, you can still use larger power lenses on a clear night to see details on Mars. It will dim from a magnitude minus 2.1 to minus 1.1 by the end of the month, and its diameter will shrink around 25%. Its two-year orbit combines with our orbit, meaning the next time we will see it in the night sky won't be for around two years. And the next time it will reach nearly the same size as this year will be in the year 2033. I can't wait until then. This time we saw Mons Olympus, the huge Valles Marineris, and the southern polar ice cap. I think we also saw the northern ice cap, but I'm not sure. Although not the best viewing because of atmospherics, it was still something I've wanted to see since I was in grade school. Ceres, a dwarf planet in the asteroid belt, can be seen in Aquarius near the Helix Nebula. Jupiter remains in the southern sky for a bit longer at an altitude of around 29 degrees, its brightness outshining any star in the area. Jupiter is gradually decreasing the angular distance to Saturn. If you want an easy to remember acronym for its four Galilean moons, try this one I made up. I eat great calamari, which stands for Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, in the order of distance from Jupiter. Saturn follows Jupiter by around five degrees and is much dimmer than Jupiter, but is less than a horizontal fist distance to the east and slightly lower at 27 degrees altitude. Saturn's shadow is now crossing the rings and will become more obvious as we leave its opposition behind from last month. A fairly bright star in a telescope near it is probably Titan at magnitude 8, its largest moon. Its other bright moons, Tethys, Dion, and Rhea, are all around 10th at magnitude, so they're quite dim. Saturn's clouds are much less pronounced than Jupiter and are a kind of washed out yellow color. As time goes by, the rings will gradually lose their tilt to us until they practically disappear in 2025. Uranus reached opposition, that is the point where we are between it and the Sun, last month on the 31st. It's steady at magnitude 5.7 and an easy target for even a small telescope though it will only be a small disk. Its usually cloudless skies offer no more than a bluish disk. Neptune, being the furthest planet, is at magnitude 7.9 and its disk spans a measly two arc seconds, so not much more than a bluish dot. 
Comet 88P slash Howell passes by Pluto, Jupiter, and Saturn, going from Sagittarius to Capricornus. You'll need a good southwest view as it rises only about 20 degrees above the horizon. You can see why Charles Messier, the famous comet hunter of the last of the late 18th, early 19th century, put M75 on his list of non-cometary objects as Howell passes close to it and it is hard to distinguish the two objects. <clears throat> At magnitude 8.3, asteroid 8 Flora outshines all the other stars in its area of the sky. You'll need excellent dark skies and you can look for it in Cetus the Whale. As always, you can get detailed positioning information from the Minor Planet Ep Ephemeris Center. I always request a group of positions spaced one hour apart to help locate such a dim object. The Leonid meteor showers occur in the early morning hours from 3 to 6 a.m. from November 6th to the 30th, with November 17th being the peak at about 15 meteors per hour. These rice grain sizes of material can put on a show. The Leonids are remnants from Comet 55P Temple Tuttle, which was last in perihelion in 1998. My favorite constellation, Orion, is now making its appearance in the evening sky, heralding winter's arrival. But the constellation of the month is now Andromeda, home to the famous Andromeda Galaxy, the furthest object you can see with the unaided eye. It is two and a half million light years away, and it is a galaxy with about twice as many stars as our own and with which we, the Milky Way galaxy, will collide in about four billion years. The resulting collision will spark the formation of numerous stars and as the two galaxies begin their dance to merge into a super galaxy, star formation will be spectacular. I hope to see it. Okay, so that's it for November 2020. Remember to keep looking up.